So as I mentioned, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, I will, I will begin this talk again. I'm going to talk about circadian rhythms and light exposure in cancer patients. And the reason why uh, it's connected with the theme of borders is because when we typically think about how we manage symptoms in cancer patients, we are usually thinking about medications or sometimes even referral to psychologists to manage symptoms such as fatigue and sleep problems. And what I would like to introduce is the idea that our environment is also really important when we think about how to manage symptoms in patients. And this is something that I wanna talk about today, specifically with respect to light exposure in cancer, in cancer patients. And these are my sources of support. Um, the EU Horizon 2020 Research and Innovation Program and the Aarhus University Research Foundation. I'm going to begin by talking about what a cancer symptom cluster is and talk about circadian rhythms, which is our 24 hour daily rhythms. I'm going to talk about entrainment of circadian rhythms and how those rhythms are linked with cancer and cancer symptoms. And then I'll talk about light and cancer symptoms and why they are important, why they are linked. So firstly, when we talk about the cancer symptom cluster, what we're talking about are the many co-occurring side and late effects associated with cancer and or its treatment. Symptoms like fatigue, mood disturbance and cognitive impairment tend to be highly correlated with each other and may co-occur. And in the case of cancer, these symptoms can be present prior to treatment, may often worsen during treatment, and for a large subset may well even persist long after treatment and they may exacerbate each other's intensity and development over time. These are four of the common symptoms that we like to study. Cancer-related fatigue is the most common side effect of cancer treatment reported by around 40% of patients at diagnosis and between 80 and 90% during radiation and chemotherapy. Depressed mood, sleep disturbance and cognitive impairment are other symptoms as well. And when I talk about cognitive impairment, what I'm talking about are changes to memory, thinking, concentration, etc. cetera. Uh, when we think about cancer disease and treatment and why they might lead to these side effects and symptoms, there are numerous mechanisms that have been explored in the literature, such as endocrine disruption, immune response, mitochondrial dysfunction or oxidative stress, DNA damage, and neurotransmitter dysregulation. But one of the mechanisms that myself and my colleagues have become very interested in is circadian rhythm disruption, because this mechanism seems to have um, close relationships with all of the other mechanisms listed there and may be responsible or underlie the manifestation of these symptoms. Now, circadian rhythms, um, they, due to the rotation of the earth, we have predictable changes in the light and temperature of our natural environment. And as a result, we have evolved circadian clocks. And circa in Latin means about, and dia means day. And they are, as the Latin words suggest, approximately 24-hour cycles of our behavior and physiology and they enable our bodies to adjust to these predictable daily environmental changes. In humans, they are predictable cycles in our behavior, physiology, and biochemistry. And importantly, they are endogenous, meaning that they are intrinsically rhythmic. The, um, and they, they are linked with the suprachiasmatic nucleus, which is a part of the brain, which is the central circadian pacemaker in our brain. It's considered our master clock. And circadian rhythms are there to prepare the body for restful sleep at some times of the day and active wakefulness at others. And here we see numerous rhythms um, shown there, such as melatonin rhythms. Our melatonin tends to increase at night and then is suppressed in the morning. Cortisol does the opposite. It tends to increase in the morning, preparing our bodies for activity during the day and decreasing by night. We also see rhythms in other areas such as mood and memory function. 
And because our rhythms are actually slightly longer than the 24 hour day on average, they need to be entrained to the 24 hour day with the help of environmental cues or zeitgebers. Zeitgebers means time givers. We can have non-photic or non-light entrainment, such as through timing of our activities, when we eat, when we socialize, when we go to sleep and wake up. But we also have photic entrainment with light, which is natural or artificial light. Light happens to be the most potent Zeitgeber that we have for the entrainment of our circadian rhythms. And light affects our circadian rhythms in this way. Basically, light stimulates, uh, we have this non-image forming photoreceptor system, which is different from our rods and our cones. It's our non-visual system. And basically we have these cells in our retina called intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells. Less than 5% of all the retinal ganglion cells are these intrinsically photosensitive cells that project, many of them project directly to that master clock in the brain. And it just so happens that peak sensitivity of those cells is at shorter wavelengths of light, typically in the blue light range around 480 nanometers. These cells, by the way, were discovered, as I mentioned, in 2002, so relatively recently. And because in industrial, industrialized societies, we are exposed to so much light at all hours of the day, life in industrialized societies can play havoc with our natural circadian cycles. As I mentioned, they are most strongly influenced by light and the body's natural response to fa fading daylight can be disturbed by a lifestyle that involves considerable light exposure well into the night. And chronic disruptions to these natural circadian rhythms have been linked to a variety of disorders, including cancer. Studies have actually shown that cancer development is closely related to a loss of circadian balance. But there's also epidemiological studies and clinical studies showing that these rhythms can increase tumor growth and cancer progression. Perhaps most famously, you may have read in the media that there are studies showing that night shift workers may have elevated risk of breast cancer among women. Um, and so the, these are the uh, disruptions I'm referring to. And when I talk about the quote, the cancer clock is not ticking, what this refers to is that both environmental changes and genetic factors can influence and be responsible for circadian rhythm disruptions that may increase our risk of cancer and or cancer progression. And so circadian rhythms are also potentially linked with the cancer symptoms that I talked about earlier at every stage of the cancer trajectory. But before I go into the research showing these links, it'll probably help for me to briefly explain how circadian rhythms are even measured. So one way is by taking specimens of blood, urine, or saliva to measure things like melatonin or cortisol levels. That is probably the most accurate way that we can measure circadian rhythms. Another way is through polysomnography, um, which is commonly used for sleep studies to evaluate people's sleep and the health of um, people's sleep cycles. They also often measure heart rate and other physiological functions that also follow circadian rhythms. Another more convenient way is using actigraphy. This is a watch-like device, similar to a Fitbit. It measures the movements of your hand and therefore your activity. It can also be used to measure skin temperature as well as light exposure. Uh, and also rhythms can be measured sort of by proxy using questionnaires and sleep diaries. In terms of cancer and cancer treatment and circadian rhythms, Across numerous cancer types, circadian disruption has been found to exist, both before and after cancer treatment. So if we think of the actigraphy, where they wear that watch-like device, kind of like a Fitbit, this is what a healthy person's uh, rhythms might look like. There's a density of activity during the day and almost no activity at night, meaning that the person is sleeping very well. When someone is going through cancer treatment, though, 
you can see that um, pre-treatment in this breast cancer patient, uh, we still see the density of activity during the day and less at night, but it's becoming a bit more blurred. And by cycle four of chemotherapy, it is much more messed up, basically, very dis disrupted. And up to 50% of patients with metastatic cancer have circadian disruption. Circadian disruption is also found to be related to poor outcome and cancer side effects. So if you look at the figure on the right, you will see fatigue, depression, and mood being measured there. The bold bars are those with less robust circadian rhythms, and the lighter bars are those with more robust circadian rhythms. And you can see that those with the less regular circadian rhythms had higher levels of fatigue, depression, and mood in that study. And so the circadian system is a potentially modifiable target to prevent or treat cancer side effects and sy symptoms. And I think what um, patients and healthcare providers and researchers love about this is that it doesn't require medications. It's non-invasive and, and hopefully as unobtrusive as possible because we're talking about light. Light may be a potential way to intervene here. And so right now I'm going to talk about light and cancer symptoms and some of the work that we've done exploring the connection between light and cancer symptoms. Um, and when we talk about light therapy, you may have heard of its use in seasonal affective disorder, which is when people have depression, usually during the winter months. Um, and uh, light therapy has become one of the standard treatments for seasonal affective disorder, along with psychotropic medications. Um, some people use light boxes, uh, as seen in the middle there, as well as um, you can have light lamps that are placed in a room. And light goggles have become more popular recently as well. The modality of light is not what's most important, but rather the parameters of light that um, impinge on the eye. So the type of device is less important than whether the light reaches the, those intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells. Now, um, I'm going to talk about the rationale for these light studies, sourcing the work of, um, the, beginning with Sonia Ancoli Israel. She is a researcher who's based at UCSD in, in California in the US. She began this work um, by testing whether light therapy might be helpful for preventing fatigue in breast cancer patients undergoing chemotherapy. And the rationale for these studies is that cancer and cancer treatment may lead to disruption of circadian rhythms and cancer-related symptoms, such as fatigue. But by bringing in some kind of light device or light exposure, that we might be able to resynchronize the circadian rhythms and reduce cancer-related symptoms. But as I mentioned earlier, what's most important are the parameters of light. If you remember earlier, I said that peak sensitivity of those cells in the eye is in the blue light range. Those cells project to that master clock in the brain. So what we want is light that peaks in that blue light range and bright white light, broad spectrum bright white light has a peak in the blue light range. And we typically use a standard comparison light comp uh, condition, such as red light, which is um, a longer wavelength light. And uh, we, for Sonia and Coley Israel's studies, she began by giving patients these boxes 30 minutes each day in the morning upon awakening. And she would measure adherence using an on-off logger that was on the back of the light boxes. And so in breast cancer patients, uh, the most important finding is that um, she found, at least for one stage of chemotherapy treatment, that the use of the bright white light box actually prevented fatigue compared with the dim red light. So you'll see where I've circled there that the dim red light patients had high levels of fatigue at that stage of chemotherapy, but those who had bright white light had lower levels. And so they concluded from that pilot work that maybe use of bright white light might prevent fatigue in these patients. 
Well, this encouraged us to explore this work further. So at Mount Sinai, Bill, William Red and Haidas Valdemar's daughter and I and others, we decided to test whether this light therapy might help fatigue and cancer survivors who had completed their treatment. And we also wanted to see if sleep might also be um, helped. This is the general study timeline. So this is a randomized controlled trial design. And what that means is that we randomly assign patients to either the bright white light or the dim red light box. We screen patients to make sure that they're fatigued first. <clears throat> and then um, once uh, we randomized the boxes to them, they went home and they used those boxes each morning for four weeks. And we tested their fatigue and sleep, et cetera, in the middle of the light therapy, towards the end of the light therapy, and then three weeks later. And what we found is that during the period of light use, is that, um, oh, by the way, I should mention that the y-axis is fatigue levels, and the higher the score, the less fatigue they had. So the healthier they were if the score was higher. And then time is on the x-axis. And so what we can see is that between baseline and four weeks, which is the end of the light box use, that those who use the bright white light box, their fatigue levels dropped to healthy levels. And this continued even when they had stopped using the light box. And I, I think perhaps this next figure is even more telling for what was happening. Because at baseline, both groups had clinically significant levels of fatigue as measured by our questionnaire. But at the end of the intervention, 60% of the dim red light group continued to have clinically significant fatigue, but no one in the bright white light group had clinically significant fatigue anymore. And when we looked at their sleep efficiency, which was a secondary outcome, and uh, sleep efficiency is basically the percentage of time that a person is in bed uh, when the person is actually sleeping. So if you think about when you're in bed at night, lying there, if you're tossing and turning a lot, you're not sleeping the whole time. So your sleep is less efficient. Perfect sleep efficiency would be if you were asleep 100% of that time. But what we regard as a clinical cutoff is around 85%. We regard 85% as clinically significant, um, important sleep efficiency, healthy sleep efficiency. Below that level, it's uh, more impaired. All groups had impaired sleep efficiency at baseline, but by the end of the intervention, only the bright white light group on average um, had healthier sleep efficiency that sustained also to three weeks after. And uh, we decided, um, because of that encouraging work, to then look at um, patients, survivors. Um, uh, uh, we decided to look at another um, uh, uh, cancer symptom, in this case, cognitive impairment. We were interested in looking at whether those who were screened as having self-reported and neuropsychologically assessed cognitive impairment might show improvements using light therapy as well. And as I mentioned earlier, cognitive impairment is another cancer symptom that's often experienced. And so we again tested this in stem cell transplant survivors. We used exactly the same design, but this time they were screened for cognitive impairment. But in this case, what we found is that both groups improved over time in terms of their cognition. And, uh, and this could have been for various reasons. Um, one reason could have been there may have been placebo effects. In other words, even those using the dim red light group may have felt that the light would help them. And, you know, there's um, well-established placebo effects that can occur. For example, if someone is using a placebo drug, we sometimes see improvements in symptoms even from use of placebo drugs. Um, there could also have been real therapeutic effects of both conditions. 
but possibly there may have even been practice effects because there are well-established improvements in people's performance on tests of memory, concentration, etc. the more people do them. In other words, they get better the more they do them quite often. And our sample was not large enough, enough for us to be able to really assess that practice effects statistically. We also didn't have a usual care group that we could have compared them with. And our sample size was quite small. Also, we looked at the circadian activity rhythms of these people and found that there was no treatment effect in terms of their rhythms either. Next, we decided to take a look at some of these symptoms by installing these lamps in, uh, in the hospitals themselves to see whether they might prevent or help their um, transplant experience during hospitalization. And we were focusing primarily on fatigue and depressed mood. This time we installed these lamps in the rooms. Uh, we compared bright white light with a dim white light. And these lights were programmed to illuminate between 7 and 10 a.m. each morning. So very similar design to the other studies, except this time the light was installed during the hospitalization and they were assessed at day two, at baseline day two, day seven, and day 14 of their transplant. And what we found in terms of depressed depressed mood is that those who had received the dim white light um, actually had worse uh, depressed mood over time than the bright white light group. All groups had depressed mood increasing over time, but it was worse in the dim white light group. Now, this led me to think about other ways of looking at the association between light and symptoms in cancer patients. And I became interested in the light exposure that people receive during their hospitalization without any additional light lighting devices. Uh, we noticed, for example, at Northwestern University's stem cell transplant unit that the east-facing rooms in the unit were considerably lighter than the west-facing rooms. And this was just from talking with the physicians and the nurses. They commented that the west-facing rooms were just so dark and they wondered, they wondered whether their symptoms might be different over time. And so what I did first was I checked out the rooms, but I also installed light meters in each room just to sort of evaluate whether there really was a legitimate difference in light emitted in each of those rooms. And sure enough, the bright light rooms that were facing, the, sorry, the rooms that were facing east were definitely brighter. Not that much brighter, but um, maybe about 50% brighter, but both groups still had pretty low um, light exposure. In any case, we wanted to see if there was a difference in their symptomatology during the course of their hospitalization based on room assignment. And bear in mind that the room assignment was based on availability and not based on any clinical parameters. So um, it was just really the luck of the draw as to whether patients would be assigned to the East Room or the West Room. And if you happen to see those rooms, you'll see the East Rooms definitely were more um, bright facing the lake. And so the clinic team generally funneled patients towards those East Rooms. And then when they filled up, they would assign them to the West Rooms. And what we saw over time was that um, for those in the west facing dimmer rooms, that their fatigue levels uh, were definitely worse over time compared with the east facing rooms. Even when we evaluated total symptom severity, we saw a very similar trend. But when we looked at self-reported cognition, um, we did not see any differential effects based on room assignment. Um, very similar to our earlier work with the light boxes as well when we looked at cognition in them.
So in conclusion, our work shows us that exposure to what we call circadian stimulating light may be useful for relieving or preventing some symptoms in the cancer symptom cluster. But current ongoing work is showing us that the picture is not so clear because to some extent we are seeing that even light that is less circadian stimulating may still be helpful. You know, when we saw those dim red light uh, boxes, the longer wavelength light, that in some cases patients improved there as well to some extent for some of symptoms. So the link between symptoms and circadian disruption in these studies um, has also not yet been fully examined. And so a key lingering question for us is, what is the nature of circadian disruption in these patients? And uh, how are they linked with the symptoms over time? And that takes us to the current collaboration that we have at Aarhus University, um, which is um, part of what I'm doing here at IAS. We're looking at examining circadian rhythms and light exposure in breast cancer patients over time and looking more closely at those links between circadian rhythms, light exposure, and those symptoms. And we are going to undertake, we are undertaking a comprehensive examination of multiple markers of circadian rhythms. So not just rest-wake activity rhythms, but also we're looking at salivary melatonin and skin temperature. And uh, we want to, you know, um, make sure that this is a comprehensive examination, more comprehensive than what we've seen so far in the literature, at least. I uh, just want to quickly thank my primary collaborators and funding sources here at Aarhus University and Aarhus University Hospital at Northwestern, um, UCSD, University of Miami Health System, and at Mount Sinai. Thank you so much.